So now we're ready to learn about the first law of thermodynamics. Yay! But before we do that, let's make sure that we've got a really clear picture in our mind of what all the terms that we'll be coming across in this law mean. So first of all, let's consider heat. So heat is represented by the letter capital Q, and it's defined as the transfer of energy across a boundary of a system due to a temperature difference between the system and its surrounds. So heat is always transferred from the body at the higher temperature to the body at lower temperature. Now, because it's an energy transfer, it's got the same units as energy. So the units for heat are joules. Now, in everyday language, heat is sometimes used a little bit differently. We might say, for example, there's a lot of heat in that cup of coffee. But we don't really mean by heat in that statement what we mean by heat formally in this course, as heat is a way of transferring energy, it's not the storage of energy in the system. So just be a little bit careful about how you interpret heat. So in the mechanics part of this course, we saw that another way to transfer energy from one system to another was to do work on the system. So James Prescott Joule actually did a lot of experiments with doing work on water with a setup similar to this one between 1844 and 1854. What he found was that if he had a mass which was dropping under the influence of gravity, so the hanging mass was losing gravitational potential energy, he could get this to turn paddle wheels inside a calorimeter which contained water. And as the mass dropped, there was a slight temperature change of the calorimeter and the water inside it. And from this, he could see that the amount of work done on the water inside the system was proportional to the heat that was transferred. So this brings us to the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics tells us that the change in internal energy of the system is equal to the heat transferred to the system plus the work done on the system. Now notice that I said work done on the system. In some textbooks, they define W as the work done by the system, in which case it has the opposite sign. But in this course, we'll use W to mean the work done on a system. So in order to work out how to calculate this, let's consider a syringe. So here I have a syringe filled with gas. Now we know from mechanics that the amount of work done on the system is equal to the force times the displacement. And by times there, I mean taking the dot product. So if I apply a force onto gas in a cylinder like this, then I am doing work on the gas. So let's calculate how much work. Let's consider moving the piston down just a small height, and let's call the height difference dy. So if I apply some force and the piston moves down a distance dy, then I'm applying the force in the same direction as the displacement, and so I've got dw is equal to f dy. Now, we've learned about the pressure of a gas before, and we've seen that it's related to the force through force is equal to pressure times area. So the molecules of gas inside my syringe are applying a force upwards on the syringe. So they're applying a force upwards and equal to PA. So if I think about the relationship between the force that I'm applying and the force that the gas molecules are applying, whenever it's in equilibrium, then these two forces are equal. They are in opposite directions though. So I can say that F, where F stands here for the applied force, is equal to minus PA, where P is the pressure of the gas and A is the cross-sectional area of my syringe. So going back to my equation for dw, I've then got that dw is equal to minus pa dy. And a times dy, well, that's the cross-sectional area times the change in height, which is just the change in volume of my gas. So I can write dw is equal to minus p dv. So this tells me that when I compress a gas, in that case, dv is negative because the volume is getting smaller, and so I'm doing positive work on the gas, 
On the other hand, if a gas expands, the work done is negative, and this means that the work is done by the gas rather than on the gas. So if I want to calculate the work with this equation, I'm going to need to integrate it. So I can write that the work done is equal to minus the integral from the initial volume to the final volume of P dV. So if I picture a plot with P along the y-axis and V along the x-axis, then the area under my curve is going to tell me about the amount of work done on the gas. Now, one of the interesting results of this is that the amount of work done doesn't depend on just the initial and final state. It also depends on how we get between those two states. So let's firstly consider the case where we initially keep the pressure constant but decrease the volume of a gas and then we'll keep the volume constant and increase the pressure. Now, the area under that curve is fairly small. On the other hand, if I start by increasing the pressure of the gas and then I decrease the volume, you can see that the area under that graph is much larger. So a lot more work is done on the gas in this second case. And of course, I can have a third case going from my initial state to my final state along a more intermediate path, in which case the work done on the gas is more intermediate.